Good morning. It's good to be here together again. I uh, thought that there would be a, a few thoughts that I would share uh, different from the main uh, message that I have this morning. As I've been here with you, thinking about the uh, 30 years ago when I lived in Belize, and uh, what I see here compared to what was here then in terms of the, of the church and the fellowship of believers. Uh, there's people here who were coming to Christ, the first um, people who were in, in the community here who were coming to Christ and joining the church, and a lot of that happened even in the years after I, I left. Uh, so the church has, has been growing uh, for, for 30 years now. And uh, I don't, uh, and I didn't ask a lot of questions uh, about some of these things, uh, but I know that a church goes through cycles in its life. And, uh, and it seems like, you know, when, when the gospel is first brought, people first receive the gospel, uh, there's an enthusiasm for, uh, for the gospel. Well, in, in the case here where you have maybe uh, missionaries coming and that sort of thing, and they're, they're, you know, out witnessing to people and seeking salvation for, for souls who are lost, uh, there's a lot of prayer and energy that goes into that, and then people come to Christ, and, and you disciple them. The church comes together in helping people count the cost and, and grow in Christ and uh, be baptized and become part of the church. And then you have, you know, so there's, there's this growth that happens, and, and, it, and it kind of, and I don't know where you are in this cycle, but a church kind of reaches a, a, a high point in spiritual growth and development. And I think that comes probably somewhere where you are now, where you have children of those who first came to Christ in those early years who are now members of the church or just becoming Christians and joining the church. And you look now and see that we're moving into uh, an, another phase of church life. Well, what can happen with with a church is that somewhere along the line, if, if it's not uh, paying attention to the, what God desires for any, for any church, um, they, they can come to this high point and start to get complacent and relax. And just, well, we have a good thing going here. We have a lot of good fellowship. We have a lot of good teaching. Uh, and, and, and a church can start to go downhill a little bit spiritually. Well, somewhere along in there, what needs to happen is the church to catch a fresh vision for what God wants to do with what is here. Okay? And every church is unique. Every church is, uh, a church is like a person, uh, like people. Every person is unique. Every church is unique. But somewhere in there, fine. What, where does God want to take us now so that we, instead of going and starting downhill, we take the next step up and we continue to, to grow and continue to progress in the ways that God wants us to. And... Uh, and a, a, a church that's been that's continued as a faithful church for many years, uh, you know, generation after generation has probably experienced that time and time again. All right, that's something we should we should expect and we should look for. Uh, but there is those are those times where we need to ask ourselves, what is God doing, or what does God want to do? And uh, and I, I want to in, encourage you in that uh, that. Uh, you know, I think that a church, a mature church like you have here, 
should should give probably 75 80 percent i don't you know that's just a number i'm pulling out of my head but a significant amount of attention to um can we say maintenance in in a sense it's not really maintenance uh but in in building on what you have give attention as you're doing with your school and other you know parents and so on with your children you don't a church is never getting stronger if it's bringing in, you know, witnessing to everybody out there and bringing in new believers, but the children are losing faith and going off into the world. You have to give attention to that. You have to give attention to building up all the believers who are here, whether they've been a believer for a long time or, or a short time. <coughs> but neither should we neglect to continue with that vision for taking the gospel to those who, um, who are lost. And in many cases in a village like this, probably, um, you know, a lot of people have heard the gospel, maybe even committed their life to Christ at some point and then turned away, whether it's in this church or as a result of the ministry of some of the other churches. Um, and so, uh, and yet, if we're not talking to people, about the Lord, if we're not out there giving opportunity, young people in the community maybe aren't hearing, or older people who have heard, um, we're missing the fact that they're at a place in life where they recognize, you know, something isn't going right, I need some help. Uh, and and if we're, we're involved in, in people's lives, we can... Uh, you know, we can catch them at that, at that time. I also think we need to recognize that people come to Christ generally. I, I think the most uh, effective, can we say, conversions are people who come to Christ little by little. They're, they're you know, they're, they, they're drawn in at the edges, and then they come in a little farther and a little farther and a little farther until they finally having counted the cost, say, this is what I'm going to commit my life to. The people who just, you know, on the spur of the moment, hear something or whatever, and they quickly come to Christ, some of those, some of those people stay faithful. I'm not, I don't want to discount that. But many, many times, those kind of people, you know, they're in and they're out. They commit their life to Christ, and then they fall away. But the person who, who, who sees and, and, and is drawn in step by step, when they finally commit their life to Christ, they're, they're doing it uh, understanding what it means, and they've counted that cost and are willing to pay the price. And so we need to, to relate to people in that way, help them at least come a little farther, a little closer, um, a little closer to Christ, uh, and, and allow the Spirit of God to continue that work in them. Uh, another thing about our um, building up from within, uh, I had to think about my own experience as a young person. I encourage you older uh, brothers and sisters, include whether it's your own children or somebody else's children, you know, as, as young people get to be um, 18, 19, 20 years old, old enough to understand and, and talk clearly about their faith. Take them along with you when you go visiting or when you go witnessing or whatever. Uh, help them learn how to defend their, their faith or to talk about their faith and, and communicate it well with people who aren't Christians. Um, some of the most powerful times that I had was having an older brother take me along to prison ministry. Uh, and helping me understand how to lead another person to Christ and, and having the opportunity to do that in that kind of a setting. That was, uh, but it just helped to strengthen my faith and, and be more solid in what I believe when I was in those situations where I had to communicate that to someone who did not believe like I did or did not believe at all. And, uh, but anyway, there's a lot more I could say about that. Uh, but I just wanted to encourage you that uh, I, you know, I'm blessed 
with what I see God has done over the 30 years and uh, see if I, if it's 30 years when I come back again, you know, hopefully I can come back before then, but let's say I, I do come in 30 years, I'll be almost 90, so uh, maybe I couldn't even see you. But <laughs> it's, uh, uh, you know, I'd like to see that, you know, that this, that, that your faith has continued to grow, the church has continued to grow, and maybe there's, uh, you know, there's other churches planted in the area, not just uh, the ones, you know, that you, you uh, the churches that you've already planted have continued to grow, and, and we can see the Lord uh, being faithful in His work among you. All right. I want to uh, think about, uh, mostly about suffering this morning and the place of suffering in our lives. And when I'm thinking about suffering, I'm thinking very, very broadly from the, the small things that we might call an irritation or um, to something, you know, big. We... Um, from uh, the suffering that we experience in relation to people. So we might experience persecution. We might experience mockery or, or people making fun of our, our faith. Uh, we might just experience a difficult relationship and it's hard to, when, you know, when things aren't going well between me and someone else, uh, that's, that's included in the kind of suffering that I'm, I'm talking about. We might experience sickness, poor health, whether it's, you know, I, I caught the, uh, something that I'm sick for two days or whether I have something that I'm sick for, for the rest of my life or I'm sick for years. Um, or, you know, something isn't going well with the plans that I had. You know, that can be, you know, today... I wanted to do this and something came up, I can't do that, what I really wanted to do. Maybe I was looking forward to it, but I had to change my plans. Uh, you know, that's kind of a, can be kind of a small thing, but it's still suffering in, in the way that I want, want us to think about it today. You've been heard many times, I suppose, uh, about the seven ordinances. Um, you know, baptism, marriage, communion, feet washing, and so on. And, uh, and those are, are uh, that's a good way to talk about those things and call attention to, uh, to some special instructions. But it's interesting to me that way back in the early days of the, of the Mennonite church, 500 years ago, a prominent writer wrote an article about the seven ordinances. And he had some of the same ones that are, we would consider to be in our list of seven ordinances. But one of the ordinances that he had in that list was the ordinance of suffering. He said, all Christians are called to suffer, and so you need to, to uh, prepare yourselves for that. And he had a lot of things to say about that. But that was one of his seven ordinances, the ordinance of suffering. And uh, that, that has stood out to me. And... Uh, I'd like to, to think about that and the place of suffering in the life of the believer. James chapter 1. Uh, I'm going to, my text is going to be in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, but I just want to read James chapter 1, verses 2 to 4. My brethren... Count it all joy when ye fall into divers temptations. And that, that word actually might have been better translated trials. Uh, things that cause us suffering. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Just like the temptation to sin, I don't believe that God causes suffering very often, if He does at all. The bad things in life, sickness, death, all those kinds of things, come as a result of sin. 
even our problems and relationships with people. If we were perfect, we would never have a problem with each other as Christians, right? But God never wastes a good problem. He says here that God uses the trying of our faith if we um, accept that and live with that suffering according to the way God wants us to, that it works in us patience or endurance. It helps us learn to endure. And when learning to endure does what God wants it to do in our lives, He says, you have the chance to become perfect. Now that, uh, that's a, a strong word, but it helps us understand how important God views the proper response in suffering and to suffering and through suffering. He wants the problems that we face to work His work in our hearts. To help us to grow, to perfect us. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. <coughs> 2 Corinthians chapter 4, I'm going to read... a. Uh, a long passage here, verses 6 through 18. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Well, that sounds pretty glorious, so what we, what we have been given. But, verse 7, we have this treasure this glory, this light that God has given to us, we have it in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are troubled on every side, yet we're not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, what we heard in our devotional this morning, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. We, having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed and therefore have I spoken, we also believe and therefore speak knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might, through the thanksgiving of many, redound to the glory of God, for which cause we faint not. But though our outward man perish, Yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. In verse 17, he says the same thing as, as he says in James 1, that these afflictions work for us something very significant, very important. And he calls the things that we face, the trials, the problems, the sufferings that we face, he says these things are things that we see, and they are temporal. <coughs> But we are, and I, we could probably talk about it a couple different ways. We look through those things, or we look past those things, beyond those things, and we see the eternal That's, that is on the other side of the temporal. And that is what helps us continue 
uh, to be faithful through suffering. So what are uh, a few of the points I'd like to pull out of this passage is one is that this, this gospel, the light, the salvation that we have is contained in an earthen vessel. It's not, a, you know, an, an earthen vessel, uh, uh, an earthen pot was uh, the cheapest kind of, of uh, container you could get. The easiest to make, didn't cost as much uh, as something that was carved out of stone or carved out of wood. Um, I'm not sure what all they might have used to make uh, containers back in those days, but an earthen vessel is pretty easy to make. You just you know get the mud together and you bake it in the sun or bake it in an oven or something like that. And uh, if it broke, you just made another one or bought another one. So we have this wonderful treasure that's not put in, in some uh, you know, sort of indestructible vessel. It's in an earthen vessel. And uh, it, it's, I think he's using that to illustrate our flesh. And so our flesh experiences suffering, whether it's, you know, we're hot today or, we're, you know, we're cold or, or we're hungry uh, or we're sick. Uh, all kinds of things happen to the vessel. Uh, and the question is, is this, how does he say it here? He, he wants it to be that way so that if we continue faithful in spite of the, the flesh, our, our earthly existence, that w everyone can see that the power comes to do that comes from God, not from us. In verses 8 and 9, he points out that these difficulties, this suffering, is, uh, doesn't need to overwhelm us. It shouldn't overwhelm us. We might be persecuted or cast down or distressed or, or perplexed, which I think would have the idea of being worried about things. Uh, but they don't gain the mastery over us. And we're following the example of Christ in his suffering, including his death, the crucifixion that we heard about earlier this morning. And I'll read more uh, verses. When, when you start to look at, look for it, you find some teaching on suffering or some comment that God gives us about suffering. Uh, not quite every page of the Bible, of, of the New Testament, but a lot. There are, uh, you know, as I was writing down verses, I just wrote, you know, I have to stop writing these verses down. I have to choose which ones I'm going to use today, uh, because if I just read through all of them, uh, we'd be here way longer than you want to be just to read through all the verses that talk about suffering in one way or the other. An important part is what he calls attention to then in verses 17 and 18, as I mentioned, that this affliction, these sufferings, these things are temporary. Someone accused me one time of just being a Christian because it makes you feel good. There's not, you know, they didn't believe that any of it was true. And, and they said it's just about... You know, this whole thing about heaven and when you die, you go to be with God and all like that. That's just an illusion. That's just something you believe to, to make you feel better. And there's no truth to that. Uh, and, you know, it gives you, uh, you know, you feel better about living. Well, you know what? He was right about that part. Now, I, he wasn't right about the part that is not true because it is true. But when we get in the worst of, of circumstances and the worst kinds of suffering, it is the fact that we know that it's temporary, that it doesn't last forever, that helps us keep going and helps us see the purpose of God. And we're willing to go through it 
because uh, we know it, it leads to something else. And God says that He will give us the strength to go through those things. If He, verse 14 and 15, if He raised up Jesus from the dead, then He says He's going to raise us up and we can see that He did that for Jesus. We know that He will do that for us. I forget now who it was here. I just overheard the comments say, saying um, something about uh, somebody who's getting old and nearing the end of their life. And, uh, you know, the idea that, well, you know, if they're suffering so much, I would just be glad if they could, uh, or maybe the person had passed on, I forget which it was. But anyway, the idea that, you know, we're, we're glad that they could go on and be delivered from their suffering. Um, we've talked about that about my, my mom. She has, she's losing her mind. Her, her, she has Alzheimer's, so she's losing her mind. And so she's, in a sense, she's already died as the person that we knew. Uh, and, um, you know, my dad just said he, he doesn't, you know, he, he'd be sad to, to lose her, and yet he's already lost her. And so if God calls her, he's ready to let her go because um, he knows that, that where she would go would be different. And, and all that stuff would be taken care of. Um, and she would be restored after death. So he's not going to try to keep her alive. What was kind of what he meant by that. God wants us to have that frame of mind, that frame of reference, that we have the courage to go on because we know that death is not the end, nor is this life the end, but that actually what is really the most important is eternity. There are other scriptures that give more reasons for why we experience suffering, but here in in 1 Corinthians 4, um, he says in verse 7 that God uses suffering to show His power. In verse 10, God uses suffering to show Jesus' life to other people. In verse 15, he says that when people see God working in us through the suffering... They'll give thanks to Him. And in verse 17, as it was in James 1, that God works a greater and eternal work in us, in our own hearts, through that suffering. We talk about following the example of Christ, and so on. But one of the things we don't maybe pay as much attention to as we should is that Jesus says very clearly many times that we are to follow His example in His suffering. Psalm 34, 19 says, Many are the afflictions of the righteous. We don't have a few afflictions. Sometimes people think that uh, being a Christian should mean I should suffer less. I think we have to expect that being a Christian means we will suffer more. Because some of the suffering, as we see in the story of Job, some of the suffering comes because of Satan's opposition against us, against God's people. And those who are a part of his kingdom, he doesn't need to try to discourage. He wants to keep them there. But for us, Satan would like to see us discouraged and turn away from God and say, well, God, just like he, he mentioned with Job, he said, Job only follows you because you're blessing him. You take away those blessings, he'll turn against you. 
Well, praise God, we have the, that testimony that Job didn't do that. He did have faith in God, not whether he was being blessed or whether he was suffering. But let's not, um, let's do more with suffering than just uh, grit our teeth and go through. Let's find out what God wants to do and allow him to do that uh, eternal work in us that he wants to do. But I want to turn to a number of passages that, uh, where Jesus talks about that. John 15, maybe the first one. And I'm just going to quickly, you don't have to turn there, I'm going to read these rather quickly. John chapter 15, verse 20. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. And then a bit later in that chapter, but all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. Matthew chapter 10. Verses 25 and 26. It is enough for the disciple that he be as his master and the servant as his Lord. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of his household? Fear, not, fear them not therefore, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed and hid that shall not be known. And that's talking about the opposition of people who, who don't love God. But we, can, we experience that even from, uh, when I say the world now, this time I'm not talking about people, I'm talking about just the, uh, the world that we live in. <coughs> in uh, Luke chapter 6, Verses 20 to 23. He lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed be ye poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are ye that hunger now, for ye shall be filled. Blessed are ye that weep now, for ye shall laugh. Blessed are ye when men shall hate you, and when they shall separate you from their company, and shall reproach you. And cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Rejoice ye in that day, and leap for joy. For behold, your reward is great in heaven, for in the like manner did their fathers unto the prophets. So he talks about being poor, being hungry, being sad, and having people oppose us. Those are the four things that he's mentioning here. And he says, rejoice, be happy, you're blessed, because God will meet your needs in those, in those things and take care of you. In 1 Peter, uh, 1 Peter has quite a bit about that. I'll just start in chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. Wherein, he's talking about salvation, said some things about salvation. Verse 6, Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. He says we need to think about these trials as something precious uh, because it is a trying or a, uh, of our faith or a putting to the test, putting our faith to the test. Uh, I I don't know Spanish very well, but uh, this is what somebody told me, and so those of you, uh, you know, most of you can correct me if I'm uh, if I'm wrong. 
Uh, but the, there's a word in Scripture where it talks about uh, putting, uh, and, and in this case I'm thinking about it now, God putting our faith to the test. In the place that, that this word is used, it's us putting things to the test. But my understanding is that um, sere is, means wax. Is that right? Sera, okay, sera means wax, all right? And so in, in this, uh, there's a word in Spanish used in the scripture, sin sera, which is without wax. And that uh, was a word that was used when back in, in uh, I mean, it's a translation of a Greek word, that was used to talk about uh, when you went to buy one of these clay pots, Sometimes when they dried them and, and heated them up and cured them, they would crack just a little bit from the heat. And so really you should throw that away and not sell it. But sometimes people would take and, and rub wax in the crack and, and rub the, the dirt in that wax so that you could not tell that there was a crack in this, in this jar. So if you were smart, when you went to buy one of the, a pot, uh, because you could fill it with water and it would hold water for a while. But, so when you went to buy a pot, you would take and hold it up to the light because if there was a crack that had been filled with wax, even if they had rubbed the dirt into the wax, you could still see the light shining through that wax. And you knew there was a crack there. And so what you wanted to do was to get a pot in the English, now we, our word sincere comes from that, all right? We wanted to get a pot that was sincere, that was all the way pure, that didn't have a crack, didn't have any wax. Well, that's what God says He's doing with our faith. It's like he, He's, in, in suffering, He's taking our faith and holding it up to the light to see if there are any cracks. That's the trial of our faith. In uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21, For hereunto were ye called, you are called to this, because Christ has suffered for us. Well, and before that he talks about suffering. Maybe I should just read. Uh, let's see, I'll start in verse 19, sorry. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 19. For this is thankworthy, if a man, for conscience toward God, endure grief, suffering wrongfully. For what glory is it if when ye are buffeted for your faults, ye take it patiently? But if when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow in his steps. Next chapter, 1 Peter chapter 3, <coughs> verse 14. But and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye. Be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you the re a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. And we sometimes talk about that as if, you know, it's when people come to us with questions, we need to be ready to give an answer. Actually, in the context here, he's saying, when you are suffering and somebody is looking on and says, how can they do that? How can they, they respond that way? That we're able to give an answer for why we are able to go through suffering with joy and with faith and not letting go of God. Going through suffering with hope and so we're able to give a reason for that hope in our suffering with meekness and fear. Then 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. You need to see suffering as normal, as usual. 
as something to be expected, not something to be, um, you know, well, that, this um, maybe another way of, of um, a problem that we have with it sometimes is we say, well, maybe something is wrong with me that I'm experiencing suffering that other people aren't experiencing. Well, in Job's case, it was because something was right with him. God trusted him that his faith was sincere. In fact, Jesus addressed that when he said, uh, when he talked about the, uh, the people that the tower fell on, he says, you know, um, are those worse sinners than anybody else because they, the tower fell on them? He said, no. That's not um, what was happening there. God doesn't... Uh, he uses suffering to purify us, but I don't think he often uses suffering to punish us. Uh, because in the New Testament times, the punishment actually is at the end of life. We experience consequences, but not punishment. Um, would be my perspective on that. Okay, I need to go on in here, and uh, I stopped in the middle of what I was reading. If he, uh, First Peter chapter four, verse twelve. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you, but rejoice, inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when His glory shall be revealed ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. All right, I see I need to keep going on through. I, again, I could just read passage after passage after passage where the Lord tells us different things about suffering. Maybe I should turn to uh, Romans chapter 8. And I'm just going to rather, I was going to read uh, 17 through 28. I probably should do that. Let me do that. Romans chapter 8, verses 17 through 28. So the Spirit, before that, it talks about the Spirit of God being in us and, and convincing us or reminding us that we are God's children. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature, the created thing, which is us and all creation, waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God, for the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. That creature, we could say that's the earthen vessel of 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 4. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now, and not only they, but ourselves also, Christians, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? In other words, we're not there yet, uh, but we're looking forward to it. But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. 
And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. A lot of things here for us to think about, but I just want to call attention to uh, a few things here. It's in our human nature to want to make sense of things. That's a part of um, <clears throat> when God created Adam and, Adam and Eve and breathed into them the, the breath of life that he was going to make uh, somebody like himself. I think that's a part of that is that God put into us the desire to understand. Uh, to understand things. And so when it comes to suffering, we say, well, let, let, I want to make sense of this. I want to understand God's purposes. I want to understand what God wants to me. And so, you know, we talk about when we pray for somebody who's sick, should we pray for healing? Or should we, uh, uh, or, but suppose God doesn't want that person to be healed. Are we praying against God if we pray for healing and God says, no, this person is going to die? from whatever they have. Well, we can take comfort from this passage that we don't have to understand all of that. God commands us very clearly in Scripture in James chapter 5 that we are to pray for the sick, for healing. All right, So we do that because that's, that's how we obey God. Here it says that then... Um, we know not what we should pray for as we ought because we don't understand all of God's purposes and what God has in mind for all these different infirmities, the suffering, whatever we're going through that's hard. So we should just pray however God, uh, or we feel like praying. You know, if we feel like praying, God deliver me from this, or, you know, um, however we're going to pray, it says here that the Holy Spirit takes our prayer and translates it into God's will, a prayer for God's will. That is, as a Christian, we know above all we want God's will to be done. So if God wants me to be sick, I'm going to accept being sick. If God... Uh, wants me to have to go through some problem with, with another person, I'm, I'm going to go through that and be faithful. We don't have to know exactly how God would want us to pray. We just need to be turning to Him, keeping our eyes on Him, and trust that whatever God's will is, because our heart is to do the will of God, the Holy Spirit will actually bring before God whatever words, um, I don't know if he'll use words, but whatever, it, um, just so we can understand that God is helping us to pray exactly what he wants to happen. Even if we don't understand it all. Even if we are... The words coming out of our mouth are one way. The words coming out of the Holy Spirit's mouth are the other way. Because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So our responsibility is just to pray. And God will, uh, the Holy Spirit will, can we say put the words, maybe not the words in our mouth, but the words that, that God hears and God will answer according to that prayer. And probably along the way our, our thoughts as we do that, as we are faithful to God and we seek God in suffering, I believe one of the things that happens is many times our thoughts become more and more in line with God. That's a part of the work that He does in us so that in the end, we are actually praying for what God wants. 
That's a part of the work that God is doing in us. And, and so, everything works out for good. For God's people. Now, it doesn't say here that everything will feel good. Or that um, even the things that we experience are good. I think we should just say sickness is evil. Sickness comes from sin and the fall. Sickness is not good. But God will use sickness to work good in us and other people. Or whatever else it is. Whatever other uh, area of suffering I believe that God's deliverance to us comes through trials, not out of trials. So, a couple of people here this week mentioned Pilgrim's Progress. And uh, I didn't go back and, and look at Pilgrim's Progress, but if I remember right, there's an opportunity where Pilgrim has the chance to go through a hard place in the road. Uh, he's coming up to that, but there's also an easy way to go around it. And uh, I forget which he chose, but whatever the case, it, it's clear by the, the end of that situation that going around it was actually the, the worst choice he could have made. And going through was the best. And that's the way it is with suffering. The best way is to go through it with God and uh, desiring that his power be shown in our lives. A quote that I read um, where he calls, you know, being happy when times are, are good, he calls it sunshine happiness. He said, Sunshine happiness shows the value of sunshine. Good times make you feel good. So it shows the value of the good things. Happiness in suffering shows the value of God. Because we couldn't be joyful. We couldn't rejoice like the scripture calls us to if it wouldn't be for God. Okay, lots more that, that we can look at in scripture, but I just want to close by reading Psalm 90. Lord, Thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth or ever, Thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, Thou art God. Thou turnest man to destruction, and sayest, Return, ye children of men. For a thousand years in Thy sight are but as yesterday, when it is past, and as a watch in the night. Thou carriest them away as with a flood. They are as asleep in the morning. They are like grass which, which groweth up. In the morning it flourisheth and groweth up, and in the evening it is cut down and wherewith and withereth. For we are consumed by thine anger, and by thy wrath are we troubled. Thou hast set our iniquities before thee, our secret sins in the light of thy countenance. For all our days are passed away in thy wrath. We spend our years as a tale that is told. The days of our years are threescore years and ten. And if by reason of strength they be fourscore years, yet is their strength labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. Who knoweth the power of thine anger? Even according to thy fear, so is thy wrath. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long, and let it repent thee concerning thy servants. O satisfy us early with thy mercy, 
that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad according to the days wherein thou hast afflicted us and the years wherein we have seen evil. I, you know, I kind of like that verse, that prayer. It's assuming that we're going to see suffering and evil, but it's saying, God, just give me as many good days as you give me bad days. That's, what it, that, that's all I'm asking for. Let thy work appear unto thy servants. Let us see what you're doing, and thy glory unto their children. And let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us, and establish thou the work of our hands upon us. Yea, the work of our hands establish thou it. Turn the time back to the brother.